Hello gamers, it is the Game Fairy and I'm here today to attempt to do Twilight Princess audio only. I got my Wiimote here, my, my nunchuck, and I am ready to get this thing started. I hope you enjoy. So our story starts in the Ordon Forest. In the forest, there is a spring, beautiful, clear blue water. The water is rushing off of the rocks ever so gently to where it sounds like a low rumble. We see two characters with their backs facing us. They are just staring into this spring. One of them is speaking and they say, Tell me. Do you ever feel a strange sadness as dusk falls? They say it's the only time when our world intersects with theirs. The only time we can feel the lingering regrets of spirits who have left our world. And this character is named Russell. They have blonde hair with a white headband, a sword on their back, and dark facial hair. That is why loneliness always pervades the hour of twilight. And they look at our other character. But enough talk of sadness. I have a favor to ask of you, Link. And we see our main character, Link, with his bright blue eyes, shaggy blonde hair, and long pointed ears. On the right side, their arm has a tattered long sleeve. I was supposed to deliver something to the royal family of Hyrule the day after tomorrow. And Link is looking intently at Russell. Russell is Link's mentor in the Ordon village. Yes, it was a task set to me by the mayor, but would you go in my stead? Russell adjusts his sitting position lightly. You have never been to Hyrule, right? And we pan out to see the water in the spring flowing. In the kingdom of Hyrule, there is a great castle. And around it is Castle Town, a community far bigger than our little village. And far bigger than Hyrule is the rest of the world the gods created. You should look upon it with your own eyes. Russell stands up slowly. It is getting late. We should head back to the village. I will talk to the mayor about this matter. And Link follows suit and stands up as well. They both walk towards Link's horse, Epona, who is a massive and muscular horse. She is brown with a long white tail and a white mane. She is carrying four bundles of sticks on her back, but is still walking a steady stride. They make their way across the bridge, and once they get to the end, they close a gate covered with moss and purple flowers. They lock the gate and chat on their way walking back to their little village. Once they arrive to Link's home, Russell waves him off and heads to his young son and beautiful wife. As they all look at Link and walk home. It is the next morning now and we see a young blonde woman barefoot walking to Link's house. 
She grabs Epona's reins and walks Epona into the forest. Shortly after, a character runs to Link's house and he is shouting for Link to come out. Hey, Link, you there? Hey, you mind helping me herd the goats? And Link is standing at his angular window at the top of his home, trying to get a gauge on what the commotion is about. They ain't listening to me lately. And Link hops back into the window. And while Link is making his way down, the character named Fado, who is a tall, muscular man with a long face and also the ranch owner of the village, is looking around. Hey, where's Epona? He thinks. When Link makes it down, he approaches Fado. Fado looks at him intently and impatiently. Come on now, hurry on up and bring Epona with you. And with that, Link is in search of Epona and decides to take off to the woods to see if he can find her. The woods appear darker than the day before. The shadows are vast, but Link continues to try to find his trusty steed. When he comes along to the spring, he sees Epona and the barefoot young blonde woman. She is approaching Epona with her palm up and places her hand gently on Epona's nose. Her name is Ilya. She has striking green eyes and short blonde hair framing her face. Oh, hi Link. She's standing in the middle of the spring with Epona. I washed Epona for you, she chirps. Link holds his head back in appreciation and shows a slight smile. Link approaches Ilya in the middle of the Ordon Spring. Epona is a girl too, she says, so you have to treat her nice like one. Oh, but listen, Link, could you do something for me? Can you use a piece of grass to play that song for me? You know, the one that Epona likes. And with that, Link steps out of the spring and heads to a strange horseshoe-shaped plant on the side of it. He picks it up and places the plant in between his lips. He blows a three-note melody twice and Epona springs forward excitedly. Link walks towards Ilya and she is fawning over the melody. It's such a nice melody, she says. Epona looks happy. Well, she's all prettied up now, so I suppose you can ride her back. But don't you make her do too much, okay? She says firmly. And Link grabs the saddle of his large horse and begins to trot around the Ordon Spring, the water splashing beneath Epona's hooves. And with a short play, he heads on to the ranch to help Fado. On the way to the ranch, Link passes through the main part of the village. It's a lively evening. We see families out, butterflies flying, cuckoos cawing. Russell the swordsman is standing near the river, striking his sword. As Link and Epona make their way through, 
they stop to speak to a local family. Ah, if it isn't young Link, are you going to close down the ranch for the day? The local shopkeeper asks. Her name is Sarah, and she is standing with her husband, Haunch, and her daughter, Beth. Sarah is a tall woman with brown hair and a white top. I just closed the shop myself. I'm sure you know all about the mischievous monkeys that have been coming into the village lately. Those things worry me a bit. I'd better lock up tight here. I couldn't stand to have any more goods stolen. Can't trust that good-for-nothing husband to do anything right. Come on, Dad, her daughter Beth starts. You can't catch a silly little monkey, she teases. And Beth is a young girl with short brown hair flipped out. She has a freckled face and wide forehead. And she is looking at her father. Haunch, who is a reserved man with a slight bend in his spine. He has a thin mustache over his lips. Uh, well, no, no, I can't, he responds to his daughter. Oh, listen to us babble on, Sarah says. I didn't mean to keep you. All right, off to work with you. And she sends us off. Link and Epona continue to trot down and run into another family. It is Russell standing near the pond with his sword and his son, Colin, who has a short angular yellow bob and his wife, Yuli, who is a blonde woman with short hair who is currently pregnant with their next child and Link speaks to them. Oh, Hi, Link, Colin says. I'm making you a fishing rod, you know. All I have left to do is paint it, so get ready for fishing, the shy boy says. Good evening, Link. This is a lovely sunset, is it not? Yuli speaks. It is kind of you to spend time with my husband, you know. It gives me time for myself. Oh, do you have to go put the livestock to bed now? And Russell, swinging his sword, looks at us and says, Ah, great timing, Link. There was something I had forgotten to tell you. My son Colin is making a fishing rod so the two of you can play together. You should finish it today, so you come get it at the house tomorrow. And with that new information, Link excitedly gets on Epona so he can finish his chores and start the next day. And there is one final person on the way to the ranch. And this is Bo, the leader of the village. Oh, Link. This tall man says he is bald with tusk on his face. It looks like you're going to help Fado. Good job. He headed up to the ranch ahead of you. Go on, climb up on Epona and get going, he urges. If you don't hurry, the sun will go down. And that is what Link does. Link hurries along and passes the opening of the ranch. Trotting upwards in a peppy manner, Link and Epona arrive to see the goats spread out across the ranch. They have circular horns on their head, striped, and dark bodies. Sorry to get you over here in such a hurry, Link, 
Fado yells. These guys have been awful skittish lately. They won't listen to a word I say. Sorry to ask, bud, but how's about you and Epona heard them real quick in the barn? We ain't got much time, so you think you can do it for me? And Link nods. Much obliged there, bud. Okay, then, go on and herd all these little scamps into the barn for me. Fado is standing in the middle of the ranch and lightly runs to the side as Link and Epona get to work. They are running along the outside of the ranch and making their way inwards as Link makes a whooping noise to careen the goats into their home for the night. Three goats have made it into their home and there are seven more out on the field as they quickly run into their cozy barn. There is one final goat standing alone and Link and Epona make quick work of this, trotting towards him, hands outstretched. The final goat is safely put away. Link, Epona, much obliged to both of y'all. I can cover everything tomorrow without having to ask or trouble you. So just sit back and relax, bud. Oh, but, uh, how about today? Want to practice with the fences? Just wait a spell, bud. I'll get them fences set up. Fado hurries away and comes back with two training fences made of wood. Whew, sorry that took so long. Okay, then, y'all ride all you want. Y'all get tired of riding just jump the gate and head back to the village, okay, bud? And Link and Epona start towards the first gate. Epona leaps, her powerful lead springing and landing. They approach the second gate. And Epona leaps over the second gate making a thumping noise when she lands. They run the gates two more times. And as the sun sets and they tire, they make their way towards the gate to the ranch, leap over and begin their ride home. We finally see the stars glisten as the two make their way safely to their house. It is the next morning, a bright and sunny one. We see three children standing outside of Link's house, screaming out to him. Hey, wake up, Link. It's morning already. The boldest and toughest one says, Link is peeking out to them through his angled window at the top of his house and is making his way to the front door. Along the way, he passes some portraits on his wall, one of Epona standing tall, another of the children of the village, there's one of Fado at the ranch and another of the goats he herded just the night before. In Link's home, you see books and crates, a large kettle over a fire, and a small area for food prep. Link also has a large dark basement and various clutter throughout the place. He heads out his front door, turning the knob to greet the children calling out to him. Link heads out of his front door 
and is met with the long ladder that leads to the entryway. He climbs down the ladder and walks over to speak with the three children, the loudest being Tallow, the shortest being Mallow, and the tallest being Beth, the shopkeeper's daughter. Oh, Link, did you hear? Tallow says excitedly. They're selling a slingshot at the store right now. A slingshot, he yells. I wonder how powerful it is. I, I need, I must try it. The child in the back named Mallow says, Tallow, if you and Mallow want it so badly, just buy it at my parents' shop, Beth chimes in. Do you see any rupees in my hand? I can't afford that thing. Come on, Beth. Can't you just loan it to us for a while? Tallow says. And Tallow is a medium-sized child with a red bandana tied on his head. Strong features and a energetic spirit. You know I'd get in trouble for that. If you two want it, save up your allowances or something. Beth leans in. But our allowances are terrible. Oh, I wish I was born into a family with a slingshot instead of one with a water wheel. The smallest of the children speaks up named Mallow. Mallow is a tiny child with a large forehead and hair tied on top of his little head. But don't be fooled, Mallow is the most intelligent child of the bunch. And after speaking to the trio, Link turns around to find a fourth child in the mix. It is Colin from the night before. Colin resembles his dad, Russell, in the eyes. Hi, Link. You have the day off work today, right? Colin is standing in front of Epona, entertaining her. So, I finished the fishing rod I was making. Link, I figured I'd give it to you first thing in the morning, but... My dad said, you just wait until Link comes to get it, so I didn't bring it to you. And with that information, Link heads out to Ordon Village. As Link enters the village, he sees Haunch staring upwards on top of their home. Haunch's home is in front of a giant tree. And up on it, we see a big hive bees flying around. Well, hey, morning, Link. Got a day off from work today, my boy? Haunch turns to Link and says, Not me. The wife's been hassling me. Today's the day to restock our store. Look, see? Up there in that tree? If you look, you can get a better view. Yeah. Some Ordon bees built themselves a fine nest up there, and I was thinking about knocking it down. Our cat hasn't come home since yesterday, so the wife's in a bad mood. At the very least, I need to bring something home to her, he says concerned. Link visits Haunch's wife, Sarah, in her shop to check in. Oh. When Link walks in, he hears a sigh. Sarah is visibly upset. She is looking at a bottle of milk, spinning its contents. Oh. 
Oh my, it's young Link. Sarah notices us, but doesn't look Link in the eyes. Welcome, my dear. You, you didn't happen to see my little cat out there, did you? He ate the fish we were going to have for supper last night, and I gave him a good scolding, but then he went out and hasn't returned. I'm so fraught with worry for him. I've exhausted myself. She picks her head up for a brief moment and then sets her head back down on her arm on the counter. And with that information, Link heads out. Entering back into the village, Link is called from above. Yo, Link, try talking to me from there with A while Z targeting. A character says. Link peeks up at the character. A brown cuckoo standing behind him, clucking happily. Hey, there you go. Over here. Yeah, your voice carries well as usual. The character says from above on a grassy platform. This character's name is Jaggle. He is the son of Mallow and Tallow. He has a boxy rectangle shaped head with long sideburns and a tiny widow's peak. Think you can teach my little tykes to talk to someone from a distance by pressing A while holding Z? So listen, why don't you climb up those vines there, Link? And Link does just that. There is a coverage of vines on the side of the platform Jaggle is standing on. Yo, there you are. Check this out. You know Sarah at the general store? Well, isn't that her cat over there? We look over to a cat with a white belly and orange and black spots on top. It's staring intently at the water nearby. He's just been sitting there next to my house, having a staring contest with the creek. You don't suppose he's thinking he's going to catch a fish, do you? <laughs> a cat can't catch no fish. Anyway, that's not what I was meaning to tell you about. I want you to take a look at something. See that grass growing off there on the edge of that rock? Haven't I seen you whistling with that stuff? And Jaggle points for us to look at a strange plant growing from the top of a nearby grassy platform. The top of the plant almost resembles the wings of a bird outstretched. I figured it was pretty rare to see it growing in a place like that, so I thought I'd let you know. I bet you could hop across these rocks with a quick little thrust, couldn't you? And Link tries and successfully makes it to the next platform. He picks up the strange plant and blows into it. He blows a long, lofty tune. And we see a falcon in the sky. Curious of the tune, the falcon swoops down and lands on Link's arm, intently waiting. It was at this moment that Link developed an idea. He turns to face the giant beehive on top of Haunch and Sarah's home and aims the falcon at it. The falcon swoops and flies in that direction, hitting the beehive as it falls to the ground and splits open as if it were an orange. Link runs over to Haunch, and Haunch excitedly says, Link, I saw all that. Calling down a hawk? 
Why didn't I think of that? I was trying to knock it down by myself, but you beat me to it, my boy. Link runs up to explore and gets a better look at the split open hive. There is bee larva on the ground. But Link points his attention to a long string of vines on the large tree behind the home. He starts climbing upwards on the tree. When he reaches the top, there is an outstretch of branches. At the tip of them, someone placed a blue and yellow ruby. Rupees are the currency in this village and Link decides to risk it and slowly walk to the edge of the tree branch and grab the blue rupee first. The blue rupee is worth five and the small yellow rupee is worth ten. He climbs down from the tree excited about his finds and continues through the village to see whom else he could help. He spots Yuli staring at the creek. Um, oh, good morning to you, she says distracted. If you are looking for my husband, he took his sword and left early this morning. But I must ask, Link, you have not seen a cradle come floating by here, have you? She looks worried. It is a baby's cradle made of finely woven tree bark. Oh, such a misfortune. How far could it have drifted, I wonder? Link decides to explore the village to see if he can track down the missing cradle. He knows how much it would mean to Yuli and decides to look hard and long. While seeking out the cradle, Link sees in the distance a small monkey. This monkey is chirping excitedly while holding on to the baby's cradle. Using the nearby plant to call down a falcon, Link sends the falcon propelling towards the monkey. The hawk swiftly flies and grabs the cradle from the grayish-brown monkey's hands. With the cradle in hand, Link hurries over to Yuli. She smiles and places her hand over her mouth, surprised. Oh, Link, that cradle! Did you go to the trouble of finding it for me? My thanks to you. Oh, that reminds me. There is something I'm supposed to give to you. Do you think you could carry that cradle and come with me back to my house? Smiling, she starts over to her small home, Link slowly behind her, carrying the cradle. My thanks to you, Link. Yes, yes, I had nearly forgotten. I am supposed to give this to you. All right, here you go. And Link holds out his hand and a fishing rod is placed in it. You got a fishing rod, a simple fishing rod with a bobber. And the fishing rod is striped yellow and black and on the end of it, there is a bobber with various colors, pink, yellow, green, purple. You can fish with just the hook, but you can catch a wider variety of fish if you use bait. It is a little unpolished, Yuli says. My son Colin made it under the instructions of his father. You can use it if you like. And Yuli sits down, exhausted from the excitement. Remembering Sarah's sadness, Link sets off to find her cat to see if there's any way he can help. He walks up behind the small cat, intently staring at the creek. 
Link gets an idea and decides to try out his new fishing rod. If it's a fish that the cat wants, maybe Link can aid it. Link tosses the small bobber out while holding the rod and a fish quickly swims over. He pulls on the rod, feeling the fish tug. And splashing out of the water, Link catches a green gill, 11 inches long. These small fries are everywhere. As the fish wiggled on the line, the cat leaps up and grabs it off Link's rod. The cat then turns on its heels and sprints back home. Link's eyes widen, surprised that the cat acted so quickly. The cat arrives at Sarah's shop and leaps through the cat door. Following behind it, Link also runs to Sarah's shop to see what occurred. When he arrives, he sees Sarah smiling, the cat on the counter lapping up milk. She speaks to him. Oh my, Link, you simply must hear this. Just take a look. My little kitty Link came back. And he brought a fish back with him. He was worried about me being angry. Oh, just look. Isn't he so cute? The way he laps up that milk. And Sarah's hand is on her cheek in admiration of the small cat. Say, my dear, why don't you have some too? I'm in a good mood, so it's on the house today, Sarah says, holding up a half-filled glass of milk. You got milk in a bottle, but this bottle's half empty. It will replenish three hearts when drinking. When the bottle's empty, you can swing it to fill it with something else. Okay, and gamers, I know this is an abrupt ending, but that is where I'm going to stop for today. I hope this works out. I'm excited to listen back and see how I did with this idea. It literally came to me at 2 a.m. last night, so I am trying to act fast, strike fast while the iron is hot in my brain, I guess. I also have a second channel now. That is where I'm going to put more casual, traditional style Let's Plays. And this channel is going to be more reserved for audio only or audiobook style gameplay. So definitely check out my second channel. It is Game Fairy Plays. I have a little bit over there right now, but I am expecting to play and try a lot more games, and I'm also expecting to play and try a lot more games on this channel as well. So subscribe to both if you'd like, um, like this video if you liked it, and I hope you're having a good day, a good night, a good time, and I'll be talking to y'all real soon with some more content. Oh, and one last thing, I will be putting this episode up on my Spotify, which is the Game Fairy Podcast on Spotify. I also mentioned this as well. I will be putting up the newer Deltarune episodes on there also, so there should be a good amount of content for you to look through if you're curious. But... With that, I'll be seeing y'all. Bye.